Welcome everybody, my name is Leila Gilby, I'm the Recruitment Director for the Executive MBA here at Saeed Business School in Oxford and I'll be introducing you to Cathy Harvey who is the Director of the Executive Degree Programmes and also the Executive MBA. Before joining Oxford, Cathy was a journalist with the BBC and a business consultant and professional coach. Cathy will be talking on women, persuasion and influence in the workplace and her session will run for around 20 minutes. After that time, we'll have the opportunity for all of you to ask questions and we can come back and talk about any of the topics raised today or indeed any of our programmes. Thank you. Leila, thank you very much and thank you for joining me for what I hope will be a stimulating and revealing 20 minutes. What I'd like to do during that time is to give you some tools but also to ask you to think a little bit more systematically about how you go about persuading people in your organisation and the kind of influence that you think you have now and the sort of influence you'd like to have in the future. So I think it's fair to say that we have gone a long way as women in having influence in organisations. There are now more women CEOs, though the numbers are small. And at the bottom of the pyramid, it's not looking too bad. As you get higher up the pyramid, things start to look a little bit less optimistic. And then when you're right at the top, although there are many studies showing different statistics in many different countries, if you look at it globally, it's not very high, 3% of the total. And for women as well who reach the top, being at the top is actually quite a risky business. Studies show that if you're a woman CEO, you're more likely to have been brought in from outside the organisation. And that means that you're far more likely to be toppled or to be ousted than someone who's come up through the ranks and may have uh, more relationships and more networks than you do. So it's a very mixed picture for women. There have been a lot of improvements and we're heading towards having quarter of all women on boards. But still, it's not a picture where half the population have equal representation. One of the most obvious ways of expressing this is, of course, the gender pay gap. The higher you go, again, the larger the pay gap is. And women are earning around 23% less than men, with senior managers earning 35% less than their male counterparts. That's not a statistic that most of us want to hear. But of course it's not all about pay, it is about having influence and being able to make a difference. There are other ways of course of being recognised, um, an Oscar is one of them, but Patricia Arquette when she received her Oscar for Boyhood recently made it clear that she wasn't willing to stand by and allow male members of the Hollywood community to earn more than women. She wanted to ask other women to make the ask and to demand equal pay. Um, of course, you could take the advice of the CEO of Microsoft, Satya Nadella, who most unfortunately was caught at a Silicon Valley uh, conference for women recently saying that actually it's not about asking, it's all about accepting that the system will support you, that if you're good enough, you will get the right raise as you go along. Afterwards, he said he'd been misinterpreted and he retracted and even asked women in Microsoft to write to him asking for a pay rise. Uh, so it was unfortunate for him. But in fact, we are taking his advice. Women do not ask. They don't ask for the next step in their career. They don't ask for the next project. And they don't ask, it would seem, for a pay rise as often as men do. Now, this is a very controversial subject. And if you think about yourself, you might ask yourself, how often do I request something in work? And you might think that you're actually quite assertive in what you do. But studies have shown that we're not quite as good or quite as forthcoming as men in asking for what we want. And probably the most famous study of this was by the economist Linda Babcock, um, who wrote a, a book called Women Don't Ask. And now she's written a follow-up book called Why Women Don't Ask. And in that book, she details some of the, uh, the experiments that she carried out, which showed that women were, in fact, less likely to initiate negotiations. And even when they did, 
their goals were lower and they ended up accepting less. She even looked at some of the MBA students in her own institution and did an experiment with them and uh, over half the men negotiated their salary whereas less than 10% of the women negotiated. So they're figures that actually should give us some pause for thought. More recently the Financial Times in the UK did a survey of salaries between men and women and discovered that the three-year salary rise amongst female MBA students or female MBA graduates I should say was nine percent below those of their male counterparts. So there's a long way to go. So why don't we ask for what we want? Um, again, there are many different views and many different studies about this. And I think it's a very complex picture. Um, it's perhaps too easy to say that girls are brought up to behave well and not to ask, and boys are brought up to be competitive and demand. And clearly we have a much, much more mixed and complex picture than that. But nevertheless, sociologists would say that the way we are brought up and the way we're socialized does have an effect. And then there seems to be something about perception. Perceptions that our options are fixed and that, as uh, the CEO of Microsoft suggested, if you do well, you will be rewarded. And in one study that was carried out, 85% um, of the men disagreed with that statement, but most of the men agreed with it. So men seem to think that the options are fluid and seem to be much more comfortable with ambiguity around negotiation and influence, whereas women seem to want to have more information and to understand what's going on. There is, it seems, a preference for transparency. So some studies have shown that where we know what the boundaries are and we understand the pay scales, or we understand how to get the next project or how to make the next move and what the steps are that need to be taken, then women are actually extremely good at getting what they want. And finally, there is a very important aspect to the way women appear to want to negotiate and want to persuade others. There seems to be much more of an emphasis on taking into account the importance of relationships and the need for a community, for the, uh, the needs of the community to be respected, as it were. So these are some things you might want to think about and think about whether they apply to you or how much or how little they apply to you. So perception is something we all think we understand, but actually it's very difficult to get your head around it. It's not about image, it's about how others see you. You are essentially how others see you. And so perception about expected behavior um, is very important. How we expect managers to behave, how we expect leaders to behave, whether they're men or women. And an experiment that was carried out using a Harvard Business School case study several years ago showed that um, when the, uh, the person in the case study, who was a venture capitalist based in Silicon Valley, had his name changed from Howard to Heidi, he, stroke she, was seen as self-promoting and slightly uncomfortable to have as a colleague. Whereas when uh, the person was portrayed as Howard, they were seen as competent and effective. Now it's some time since this study was uh, conducted and there have been some updates uh, since then and I understand that the updates show that uh, in fact things are moving in the right direction and some people found that Heidi was more competent and effective. So there's a lot of optimism for the future. Um, but still, it, it, it serves to help us understand, I think, how important um, our perception of expected behavior uh, influences the way we think about people. So thinking about that and thinking about context is vital. And that's what I want to do in the next few slides. I don't know if you can read the caption on this punch cartoon, uh, I bought this for my husband a few years ago and we still have it um, on one of the mantelpieces in our home and both of us laugh. I'm sure all of us can laugh at it and of course many of us can recognise it. There's been a lot written about how women are perceived uh, in communication, particularly uh, 
in communication in organisations, in meetings for instance. Um, and Deborah Tannen is probably the most famous author about this and she's written a lot about how uh, women can come across as uh, more aggressive um, whereas men are not seen as aggressive. And you should go and read some of her books because they're fascinating insight into the differences between how men and women communicate. But the important thing, of course, is to study your context and to work out how you think you can make the most of it and adapt to it. So when you're thinking about your own organizational presence, how your colleagues perceive you and how they perceive your ambitions, you can think of it in several ways. First of all, there's how you perform. Do you actually deliver on the task? Many women think that being able to deliver is enough, and many women who do deliver go on to be very successful. But showing that you're in charge of all the detail and that you can deliver on the results is never enough. So then there's your image, the impression that others have of you. And that, of course, is not something that you always have complete control of, but you should be aware of it. And then there are networks and how you use the relationships to improve your chances of success when you're persuading somebody. That's very important and something that all of us as women need to think about increasingly in order to be successful. The other um, thing to think about is that there are lots of different ways of having an influence. There are, if you like, um, several currencies. There's no one technique. There's no one magic bullet that you can use to improve your chances of uh, influencing somebody in a negotiation. But here are some ideas which you might want to think about. First of all, are you creating a compelling vision? Are you selling the idea? Are you making it attractive? And then, as we mentioned before, is there something that you can do to help somebody else deliver on their goals? Sometimes status is very important, and how you prop up other people's status, as well as improving your own, can have a really significant impression on others. And again, as I said before, networks. How are you going to use the relationships? And what praise do you give to others? And do you seek praise from others in order to enhance your own self-esteem? Often all these things are in a very delicate balance, uh, depending on the situation that you're in but it's worth reminding yourself that they all have a big impact to play in how you appear to influence others and persuade them. You may uh, know the work of Robert Caldini, who was a psychology professor, of course, uh, in Arizona in the United States, and he came up with some uh, fundamental princ principles of influence, um, again, which repeat some of the ideas of, of uh, these currencies that I mentioned. Essentially, there is a likability bias. So if we like someone and we, we feel that we have something in common with them, we are more likely to be able to do business with them. This seems like common sense, but it's often not common sense when you're under stress. Then the principle of reciprocity. This is not just doing somebody a favor. This is doing the kind of favor for somebody that you would like to have done for yourself. So give what you want to receive. And then appeal to the kind of peer pressure and peer power that you have available to you. Look to others to confirm that you're doing the right thing. And be very consistent in the way that you seek to influence, as well as showing your expertise and don't assume that everybody knows how expert you are. So these are, again, very uh, clear principles hard to put into practice in every situation, but great to remember when you're thinking about the next step in your career. And it's very much about how you communicate. And here, I think we need to turn to a man, Aristotle, to remind us um, of some of the rules of rhetoric, which are still um, very compelling today. So when you're communicating, you need to appeal not just to the facts, it's good to be rational, and it's good to have marshaled all the facts, though not too many in too much detail, because don't forget you can confuse people. But that's never enough. You need to appeal to the ethos, the authority, the trust, and the values, 
um, that matter both to the person receiving the message and the messenger. You need to be trusted and you need to employ emotion in a good way. You need to back up your argument with stories which are compelling um, and appeal to people's motives as well as to their knowledge and understanding. One of the reasons that TED Talks are often so compelling is that you will notice how many personal stories people tell and how the speakers in the TED Talks use those stories to get across um, a point that they want to make which they think unites both the audience and themselves. So thinking about that, perhaps looking at some of the TED Talks that you've, uh, you've been most interested in yourself is, is an excellent technique. So thinking personally and acting communally is, is what Sheryl Sandberg um, from Facebook advised people to do in her book, Lean In. And she is a controversial figure to many feminists, but one of the, the things that she was trying to get across, I think, was something that's very positive for many women. The fact that we do tend to have a tendency to um, think very communally and think about the relationships within a negotiation and within a conversation means that we can appeal to the uh, higher purpose, if you like, of our organizations when we're seeking to have an influence. So using the language of us rather than me is very important. And creating what, what's been called a relational account. Connect your goals to the organization um, and put some money in that account so that you get something back out of it. So back to pay, which we mentioned at the beginning of this conversation. Um, and also back to Linda Babcock and some of the experiments that she conducted for her book. What she discovered was that when women were negotiating for a higher salary in some of her experiments, and they just made a very straightforward case, saying, I'm worth it, the outcome was often negative. But the social outcome, that is how they're perceived within the organisation, was also negative. So not, um, not the kind of outcome that you would want to have. Perhaps they had an outside offer, and they mentioned that in the negotiation. And that sometimes meant that they got the pay rise they requested. But the bad news is that it still didn't help the way they were perceived within the organisation. The social outcome was still negative. But when they managed to create um, what was described as a relational account and express their desire for a pay rise uh, with in line with the goals of the organisation. Um, they had a positive outcome in terms of getting the salary rise and in terms of the way they were perceived within the organisation. So I can't promise that this will be the case for you, but um, it's a good thing to keep in mind when you're thinking uh, about negotiating your next pay rise. So how can you influence negotiation? By which I don't just mean money, as Patricia Arquette realized herself. The Oscar isn't really um, about the cash for many of us. It's about recognition, it's about going up the elevator, and also about having the kind of status that gives you the power to change things. So if you want to influence the way you can negotiate, having a very integrative approach is going to be the way forward. Think carefully about the questions that you need to ask and that your organisation is also trying to answer. And share as much information as you can. Create a sense that between the two of you, you are trying to solve a problem, you're brainstorming something, um, and at the end of it, both of you are going to come out with an answer. And try and have what's been described as uh, negotiation jujitsu. That is, be very flexible, be very agile, be very willing to change your style, to adapt the way you speak, the way you act. Um, and to think very carefully about the perceptions of your audience. And do what you can to get as much information as you can, because as we've seen, as women, the more information we have, the more the differences might fade, and we may be more able to negotiate successfully in a very transparent situation. And there's also more than one conversation going on when you're negotiating. It's not just the issue, of course, 
It's the relationship between you and the person you're speaking to and the context that's in, the so-called shadow negotiation that makes a difference. And that's why thinking about perception, thinking about expected behaviour and really concentrating on diagnosing the context that you're in is very important. So, to make it happen, it's going to be complex. You need to think about the horizon that you have, the time horizon as well. How far do you go and how quickly do you need to get there? And think very carefully about the context, how are you seen in that context? Be flexible, adapt, um, and be willing as well to actively manage the perception that others might have of you. And build some trust with the people you need to negotiate with. Um, put some money in your own bank to, to influence. Find some currency. Discover which currency works best for you and make sure you use it um, in the best possible way and to the best advantage. And remember Aristotle, um, logic and detail and facts are not enough. You need to appeal to emotion and you need to appeal to people's values and beliefs. And also use the principle of reciprocity. Think about your networks and think about who owes you a favour and who you can do something for. Give what you want to get back. Perception, behaviour and context. Remembering these three things are really going to help you as you think carefully about your own next step. And don't be afraid to ask. Um, we shouldn't be taking the advice of the CEO of Microsoft, that's for sure. Perhaps Patricia Arquette might be the better option. So I have really enjoyed discussing this with you.